Okay, that's good. We started learning about um, Chol of Yisrael, that the Mishnah says, that milk that was milked by a guy and the Jew didn't watch the milking, you're not allowed to drink. We discussed this whole thing. Um, in fact, it even brought down in Alocha that before they milk the cows for Chol of Yisrael, you have to make sure that the vats that have the milk in it are empty. Because if there's already non chol of Yisrael milk in the vats, and now you're going to put chol of Yisrael into the vats, it's a problem. Now, there's another issue with the chol of Yisrael, which is in today's world, obviously. Today we have what's called pasteurization. Now, let me just preface it with a din. In Shkunarch it says, again, we're talking about not the hetatum of today, of what's called chol of stam, that people are lenient because you can't mix pig's milk into the milk. But in the actual din of cholov, what's called cholov akum, milk of a goy, versus milk of a yid, Shechonorach, it says like this, if you go from non cholov Yisrael utensils to cholov Yisrael, you have to kosher the utensils. And as in Shechonorach, it says, I'm not talking again with the leniencies of today, but in Shechonorach, it says, the utensils are treif, and therefore, if you go from non cholov Yisrael to cholov Yisrael, you have to kosher the utensils. That's what it says clearly in Shechonorach. Now, today, we don't just take raw milk and drink raw milk. So today, they pasteurize the milk. The milk goes through a pasteurization process. It goes through a machine that actually pasteurizes, or cooks the milk, pasteurizes the milk, and then, you know, whatever they do, they homogenize it, and, the, and then you have the milk. So there are few farms, by the way, that have their own pasteurizers. In other words, the whole farm is Chol so the whole thing, they work in a thing. They milk the cows and you pasteurize it. Not all Chalif Yisrael companies have their own farms. So what they need to do, or this is price to cheese, don't forget, it applies to cheese and all these types of things that you're taking the non Chalif Yisrael milk. So they have to pasteurize the milk. So what do they do? So, but you can't use the same pasture. Pasteurization gets up to approximately 185, 190 degrees. That's the heat of pasteurizing. Now, things become treif at the amount of Yatsa lettuce bait, which in degrees we learned is 110 degrees. That means if you cook something treif in a pot at 110 degrees, the pot becomes not kosher because it's hot enough that it becomes what's called yatsa letters by that you can burn your hand by it, and therefore it need, it becomes treif. Now, when it comes to kashering such a pot, so there's two opinions in aloha in the dinam of kashering, how you're able to kasher that pot. There are opinions that say that if the pot became treif, let's say with 110 degrees or 150 degrees, or 185 degrees. So how do you kosher it? With 185 degrees, the same way it became treif. That's the way you make a kosher. As the rule is, kabolte, kabol a kachperlte. The way it absorbs, so the same heat makes it spit up. So therefore, the bottom line is, if the pasteurizers were used for non cholivy slow milk, so then the pasteurizers need to be koshered. Now, the question is, how do you cash the pasteurizer? So if, let's say you're just going to rely on the leniency that if it became tray for 185 degrees, you can kosher it at 185 degrees. And we know when you cash it with Hagalah, the hot water, you have to wait 24 hours before you kosher it. So what they'll do is, let's see, the, 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 the regular dairy doesn't milk on Shabbos. They milk on Shabbos, but they they don't use the milk, whatever. So there's 24 hours, they don't pasteurize the milk. Then the kosher agency comes in and they kosher the pasteurizer. Now, some people are lenient and they say, listen, if it became trade at 185, you kosher at 185. So what do they do? Very simple. They run, instead of milk through the pasteurizer, they run water through the pasteurizer to kosher it. So then, the water heats up to 185 degrees, just like it became trafe with the milk. And then you kosher it 185 degrees. But there are other opinions that say no, that even if it became trafe at 110, 20, 30, 50, 80, whatever it is, you need to kosher it 212. 212. What's 212? 212 is a number. 212 is where water boils at sea level. 
Okay? If you went to school and you, you. you have a, 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 a pressure cooker, pressure cooker cooks less, you, you, because of the pressure, it cooks less than 212 degrees. Okay, but normally, 212 degrees at sea level is the amount of water, heat it takes for water to boil. So the Arab poskim and Al-Trebbe holds, so holds like that, even though you'd be on the other opinion also, but Al-Trebbe holds, you have to kasher it at, we're going to use the number 212, meaning to kasher it at 185 degrees is not enough, you have to kosher it at 212. Now, the problem with that is, the pasteurizer is made to handle a heat of 185, 190 degrees. It's not necessarily made for 212 degrees because it's much hotter, right? So sometimes they have to figure out the way mechanically how to make that the pasteurizer can handle the 212 degrees. And therefore, a lot of times you see, not so much anymore, but at the beginning they would say, used to write on the labels, kosher, kosher the 212. Not that it's not good, but many people hold that even if he became trafe at 185, you still need to kosher at 212. But the bottom line is the pasteurizers need to be kosher. And the vats, if they became hot, you know, trafe with hot, also have to be kosher. So that's the story with the milk. So the milk, today, in today's world, because you want to make sure it's Chol Yisrael, and they don't have their own dairies, so you have to kosher the milk from not Chol Yisrael to Chol Yisrael, so then you have to kosher it at 212. That's the bottom line of that. Now, there are opinions, and this is very important, by the way, there are opinions that hold that milk powder doesn't have to be Chol Yisrael. There are such opinions that hold milk powder doesn't why because it's not real milk it's not the exate of the milk it's the powder of the milk they took out the water they made the powder so there are opinions in Allah that hold powdered milk doesn't need to be chal viso where is this very relevant in chocolate because the chocolate companies don't use regular milk they use powdered milk so there are many companies in Eretz Yisrael by the way that they use powdered milk but it's not chal viso but they write on it they write on it, no, they, now they started writing because there was a big tumult about it. But if you're machmer, like we are, the powdered milk also has to be chol of Yisrael. So you have to be careful with the chocolates, make sure they have a good hechshin that it's really chol of Yisrael and they don't use powdered milk. Another interesting thing with chol of Yisrael is there are opinions that hold butter doesn't have to be chol of Yisrael. Why doesn't butter have to be chol of Yisrael? Because butter cannot be made from pig's milk. It's just impossible. You can't make butter from pig's milk. And cheese too. No, cheese you could. You could? Yeah. But also, it's not the same. It doesn't last. It doesn't last, but they can make it. It's possible to make. Oh, but why you say... Let's, let me tell you a little secret. In case you didn't know, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, in the shtetl in Europe, they didn't have refrigeration. Yeah, you know that? How long did the milk last already? A day. A day, two days especially in the summer. In the winter, <laughs> the containers froze, right? But in the summer, how long did milk last? So nothing, doesn't matter if it didn't last. They ate everything that they milked. They ate right away because their milk didn't last. That's why it is an interesting thing, going off topic for a second. There are many people that don't eat dairy on Pesach. Where did that originate from? It's not a halachic thing. In Europe... Many people didn't have dairy on Pesach for practical reasons. Why not? Number one, we learned, we learned when we're learning Yolchus Pesach, milk that you use on Pesach must be milked before Pesach. You can't use on Pesach milk that was milked during Pesach because the cow eats chametz and whatever it's called, whatever. Bottom line is, you have to milk the cow before Pesach. The milk has to come before Pesach. So, for, you're going to milk the the milk before Pesach, how long is it going to last already without refrigeration? A few days. And not only that, the first two days are Yom Tif. Yom Tif, you have meat, basically. So uh, maybe you have a coffee, but... So how much milk are you going to use already? So, and, and not only that, they were too poor to afford milk dishes, dairy dishes. Right? Meat you for sure have to eat on Pesach. Right? Yom Tif, Shabbos, it's meat. Milk, that means they would need separate dishes for milk. 
Who had money then to buy dish? They didn't have disposable stuff in those days. So who had money to buy milk and conditions? They didn't have. So they didn't have money to buy milk and conditions. The milk wouldn't last anyway. So therefore, many people, from a practical point of view, didn't eat milk at some Pesach. But they could eat cheese. Yeah, but the, but the cheese had to be made for milk before Pesach. So, oh, okay, you're right. They technically were able to eat, but they didn't eat milk. And again, the second reason applied, they didn't have enough money to buy two sets of dishes for milk and meat. So therefore, it became in many places in Europe a custom, you don't eat dairy on Pesach. So therefore, this trickled trickle down that, uh, you know, you do what you did in uh, 300 years ago. So many people don't eat dairy on Pesach. But there's no basis in Aloha that dairy is no good for Pesach. At the end of years ago, I didn't eat a lot. Huh? They waited 50 days. What? They waited 50 days. They waited 50 days. Okay. So one minute. So coming back to the butter. So some people say butter is not a problem because you can't make uh, cheese out, you can't make butter out of pig's milk. But the pearl... Uh, most boss can hold no. You have to be machma and butter, especially if it was first milked as milk. And then they took the milk and made butter out of it, so then many boss can say you're not allowed to eat the butter. But that that's the story with uh, the Chol of Yisro. Probably today with chemicals, you could uh, make uh, uh, cheese out of pig's milk, no? I don't know. <laughs> no, not necessarily. Butter, you know, it's because it's because it's probably because it's not fine. But by the way, even even uh, if you don't keep Chol of Yisrael, they rely on the Heter of Chol of Stam, but cheese must have a Hechshed. Can't say, okay, what's cheese? It's made from milk, big deal. There's, because cheese could have trafing, mamish trafe ingredients, besides the milk. It can have trafe ingredients. And uh, the, besides the rennet, and, uh, there's a lot of things that could be trafe in cheese. So cheese must have a proper Hechshed anyway, even be, if people are not Machman Chol of Yisrael, but they still need um, to make sure there's a supervision on the cheese, otherwise you're not allowed to eat it because it could be treif. Um Okay, that's basically it in the simple... Huh? Yogurt, same thing. It has to be a yogurt with a hechsher. I'm saying even if somebody is more lenient with, with non holy Yisrael today, in fact, you know, it's very interesting. The OK, the OK hechsher... Yeah, the OU, the OK. but the OK was started by Rabbi Beryl Levy. Now it's run by his son, Rabbi Daniel Levy. Beryl Levy, was, when he started the OK, it was a private company originally. Okay? And he was a Lubavitcher. And um, the Rebbe told him, the Rebbe told him that he didn't, was to ask the Rebbe if he should give a heksha non chol Yisrael things or not, because, you know, it wasn't his standard. His standard was chol Yisrael. And the Rebbe told him he should definitely give a heksha non chol Yisrael. The Rebbe told him he should give a heksha non chol Yisrael, because there's a lot of Jews that are not eating chol Yisrael, at least they'll eat kosher. Because if you don't give a heksha on it, they won't be kosher, they'll eat trace. Forget the milk aspect of it. So the Rebbe told him he should be fetish, give should definitely give a hechshir on Chol Yisrael. Therefore, you have OKD, which is not Chol Yisrael. Unless if it says it's Chol Yisrael. But you have uh, OKD and OUD and all these hechshirim uh, that give a hechshir. But just because it says OU or OK does not mean necessarily it's Chol Yisrael. It doesn't necessarily mean it's Chol Yisrael. Or for that matter, it doesn't necessarily mean it's Pas Yisrael. Like we said. It's not necessarily Pas Yisrael. Because they give a hechshin and, and pass powder also. Um, huh? There's a lot of the Hamish, and not only that, there's a lot of hechshidim in New York also that only give the chsidish hechshidim, are only on Chol of Yisrael. They don't give on non Chol of Yisrael. Didn't the Rebbe, did the Rebbe ever has told you okay to give hechshidim on non Chol of Yisrael things? We just said. Oh, I wasn't thinking. We said the Rebbe Fadish told him to give a hechshidim on non Chol of Yisrael. A non chol of Yisrael, huh? Star K is uh, what, what's the, the, the Star K? D- no, Star K is in Baltimore, Rabbi Heinemann. It's more litfish than anything else. But the those echshenim give a hechshon chol of akum, chol of you know not chol of Yisrael also. Some of their things it says if it says chol of Yisrael, it's chol of Yisrael. Like uh, the Star K gives a hechshon pride of the farm milk. Yeah, and part of um, ice cream and things like that. That's all Chol of Yisrael. 
But we cannot leave the dairy uh, equipment when it's not Kalam Israel. If it's VE, we'll, we'll get into that.